My name is Sven Tritel, and I'm a exploration geophysicist. Hello, my name is Andrew Gary, and welcome to Seismic Sound Off, in-depth conversations in applied geophysics. In this episode, I am joined by Swin Tritel. Swin was born in Germany, raised in Argentina. He's an MIT-educated geophysicist who, along with Enders Robinson, was instrumental in the transition of exploration geophysics from analog to digital recording and data processing. Sven has published over 40 papers and has received numerous society awards, including SEG's Reginald Fezzedin Award in 1969 and honorary membership in 1983. He also co-authored two books with Enders Robinson, the most recent, Digital Imaging and Deconvolution, that serves as the basis for the May 23rd through 26th virtual course he is co-hosting with Enders. The course is called Geophysical Signal Processing 101, sponsored by the Geophysical Society of Houston and the SEG. Visit seg.org forward slash podcast to register for the course. Sven discusses his signal processing course, the historical transition from analog to digital, and his decades-long collaboration with Enders Robinson next. Stay with us. Could you walk me through a little bit of that transition of exploration geophysics from analog to digital? Yes, that's a very good question. Actually, you are talking to one of the earliest analog to digital machines. When we were graduate students, the digitization of a seismogram was performed by humans, namely graduate students. And usually we worked in pairs. One person had a plastic device on which there was etched a numerical scale, and he read or she read the amplitudes of the excursions of a seismic trace to the person who sat there with a piece of paper and wrote down the value of the amplitude of, uh, say, a given point in time of uh, the uh, seismic trace. And this was done at intervals of 2.5 milliseconds. Don't ask me why we chose 2.5 milliseconds. Uh, Today, of course, you can, this is all done uh, automatically and one can specify any convenient time increment. But for some reason, we chose 2.5 milliseconds. And this was all done by grad students. So you can imagine that the amount of data we had available to us was very limited because uh, it was time consuming. And uh, if you do this after a while, you begin to make gross errors. And uh, those errors could easily destroy whatever signals you're trying to extract from the recordings. So this was a complication. But by the time the oil industry began to implement these technologies, there were automatic so-called analog to digital devices being developed. And today, these devices are far more sophisticated than they were when we first got started. But nobody in his right mind in exploration geophysics digitizes information by hand. That's only of historical interest. But it is true that when we were grad students, we had, we didn't have these devices. So we had to do this by hand. And the the miracle is that in spite of errors that we undoubtedly made, because after a while when you stare at these analog recordings, your eyes begin to tear up and you're bound to make errors. But even so, the data was not that badly corrupted, so we could still extract meaningful results from the recordings. 
You know, you said uh, at the beginning, uh, before we started taping, that you and Enders go back to 1962. Yeah, how has your collaboration with Enders impacted your, your life and your career? Well, actually, my uh, interaction with Enders goes back further. Uh, I graduated from MIT with an undergraduate degree in June of 1953. And then uh, I applied for graduate school, and I didn't know any better, so I simply stayed at MIT. I was admitted to graduate school, but I also felt I needed to eat, which meant that I needed a remunerated occupation. Besides being a student at MIT, I had to, I had to live. And so I was offered a research assistantship in the so-called geophysical analysis group, which had been formed at MIT in the year before that, 1952. It was the first consortium sponsored by oil companies and service companies. I should say one of the first, uh, because there was another one as well, consortia, which this format incidentally survives to this day. But this um, consortium began operations in 1952, before I came on board, and it was run by Anders Robinson. He was the guy in charge. Anders at that time had also graduated from MIT, but before me with a bachelor's in mathematics and a master's degree in economics. He was still in the math department, when the possibility of such a consortium was discussed between two professors in the mathematics department and another professor in the uh, earth sciences department. And Anders was chosen to head this consortium, which was sponsored by a group of oil and service companies, most of which have cease to exist today, although there are few survivors. So Anders and I met in 1953 when I became a research assistant with the Geophysical Analysis Group. And this consortium uh, lasted until 1957 when, when it was disbanded because what happened is Anders received his PhD in 1954 and left to work for an oil company. Then it was taken over by another gentleman who was extremely able, but uh, unfortunately uh, he became more interested in solving theoretical problems, which were not of direct uh, interest to an oil company or a geophysical service company. So to make a long story short, the oil companies became disappointed in the, in the service companies and the, the consortium came to an end in 1957. And matters would have rested there were it not for the fact that I ended up in 1960 with uh, what was was then called Stanolin Oil and Gas Company here in Tulsa. And at that time, uh, the oil companies were doing their own research. There were many oil companies that had research laboratories, including Stanolin. But moreover, people, although it's hard to believe that this was true then, we were given a lot of freedom to follow our bliss, which means that when I arrived on the scene, I was, I asked, well, what should I be working on? And I was told, well, you look at what we're doing and then you decide what you should be investigating. So I naturally 
told my boss that I wanted to work in geophysical signal processing, which is what I had learned as a graduate student working on the geophysical analysis group. And so that's what I did for a while. And then I realized that it would be awfully nice uh, if I had somebody to work with on this topic. And I mentioned to management that it would be a good idea to get Anders Robinson to work with me as a consultant. And Anders at the time was in Sweden. So he, he actually visited our, our lab for a week or two. But thereafter, we collaborated by regular mail and not by email for the simple reason that email had not yet arrived. There was no email. It was just regular mail. And so that collaboration lasted with interruptions into the 70s and is the basis of the two books that we wrote jointly to say nothing of a large number of joint papers that we published over an interval of, I would say, roughly 20 years. You speak of how the seismic methods today go back to the work of great scientists from centuries ago. In a previous interview, you stated how you basically built on the foundation laid by other often unsung scientists who came before you. How has that perspective and understanding shaped your work? Well, in nowadays, everybody stands on the shoulders of giants because science is so complicated and so many faceted that nobody actually does science all by himself or herself. So we stand not only on the shoulders of giants, I mean, the first person who said this was Isaac Newton, who actually operated in a world where there were relatively few scientists, either his contemporaries or people who came before him. We don't have that privilege today. There are, the, there, we have to consider the work of hundreds or thousands of colleagues as well. And every one of them has contributed something of which we make use. Now, there are people even in our game who are particularly outstanding. And as far as the subject that Anders and I have contributed in the past, which is signal processing in geophysical exploration, one of the giants in, who lived in our era because he was one of uh, Enders Robinson's professors is Norbert Wiener, who is quite well known to the world at large. And a lot of the early work in geophysical signal processing is based on Norbert Wiener's work. And we were lucky enough as students to be at MIT at the time that Wiener was teaching there. Anders actually took a course, several courses from him. I only took one, and I must say I understood very little of what I was hearing. But it took me many years to go through his books and his articles to finally begin to understand what he was doing. And his influence persists to this day. He was the, one of the first, if not the first, individual to teach us how to separate seismic signals from seismic noise. The interesting thing is that Wiener only worked in a so-called continuum. In other words, the observations are made in an analog fashion and recorded continuously over time. The trouble is that a digital computer can only work on discrete set of observations. And so the bridge between the, di the analog world and the digital world, which began to appear 
in the late 50s or early 60s, that bridge was traversed by Wiener's successors. And so that without traversing that bridge, then of course, digital computers could not be used in signal processing and certainly not in geophysical signal processing. So that step was not done by Wiener, but it was done by one of his colleagues also at MIT, whose name was Norman Levinson, who actually took Wiener's results and adapted them to the discrete case. So instead of going from a continuum, continuous recording, he went to a discrete recording. You know, speaking of the, of the two books that you and Enders co-wrote, were you surprised by the advancements in, in your field between geophysical signal analysis to your 2008 book, Digital Imaging and Deconvolution? Yes, of course, because uh, the entire industry went digital in the 60s. By the, in the early 60s, that was not the case. But by the end of the decade, uh, there was not a single oil company or service company that had not gone into the digital world. So, of course, we felt good about that because we were instrumental in making this possible. But I must add that we were not the only ones responsible for this innovation. There were people in the oil companies who also saw what was coming. But where we perhaps innovated was in our series of elementary, easy to understand papers that popularized the field and uh, introduced the subject to more experienced geophysicists at the time who had not had training in digital techniques and who could read our papers without too much effort because we tried to make things uh, very simple. And we still use this technique to this day. That's why we call our course Geophysical Signal Processing 101. So in that sense, nothing has changed. We, the course that we're giving in later this month, we could have given in 1965 with a few add-ons and of course full waveform inversion is definitely that's much newer that did not exist in in 1965 because the computers w would have not have been up to it people were talking about what is now called full waveform inversion in the 60s but everybody knew that the digital computers at the time were not up to solving real life problems. We could solve toy problems, cartoon problems, but not real life problems, which is certainly not the case today. So you, you and Enders have designed a course, and I wanted you to tell me a little bit about who you and Enders have designed your upcoming course for. We've designed this course out of completely elementary level. In other words, we call it 101 because that's what it is. It is designed for people who have no experience in the details of, uh, and particulars of uh, digital filtering, digital processing of seismic data. So this is not for the advanced individuals this is for people who have not been exposed to these subjects, but who may in fact be working for companies in which they apply software developed by others. But we found over the years that people apply software written by others without having a clue about what it is that they're applying. And the course that we've designed, which is based on a book that the two of us wrote, which was published by the SEG in 2008. That's actually designed for beginners. And these, these are real beginners. 
not beginners, just real ones. You know, speaking of, of your 2008 book, uh, Full Wave Form Inversion isn't mentioned in that book. You know, I, how has the development of FWI impacted signal processing? Well, we've decided to include Full Wave Form Inversion, which is actually being covered by Enders, not by me, because it is a very timely subject and an area of active research. At present, so we felt that we should include that subject as well, even though it is not explicitly mentioned in our book. The book is, after all, now almost 10 years old, and our field, luckily, is not stationary, it evolves over time. What do you and Enders hope to achieve with this course? Well, we hope to reach individuals, particularly young, younger people, younger colleagues, who have worked in the industry either in processing uh, shops or for actual oil companies, and who process data but who are not familiar with the software written by others that they are using in their day-to-day operation. But it turns out that people who use software written by others to process seismic data are not often use the, do not often use the the software that they have given to them in an optimal manner because they will do a much better job if they have a better understanding of what they are doing. And uh, that has been the exp- our experience in the past and has also been the experience of many others. If you know what a software package is based on, what the theory behind it uh, is based on, you do a better day-to-day job in applying the software to real seismic data. And it's as true today as it was a decade ago. It's a general principle. If you hand somebody what is essentially is a black box and tell him to apply it uh, to data, the person will do a, a job, a creditable job, but something will go wrong at some point. And so, a person who doesn't know what's in that black box is less likely to solve the problem than one who is familiar with the theory that is behind a particular computer algorithm that is used uh, in his or his or her uh, computing environment. So we have always felt that the only way you can learn how a particular computing algorithm works is to actually solve very simple problems with pencil and paper. We do have slides with very simple examples which are not make use of actual seismic recordings because there would be far much, uh, far too much data to contend with. And so we go to very simple examples where we imagine that the seismic trace consists maybe of five or ten discrete observations, but with very such small samples, you can still illustrate the basic ideas. You've spoken a lot about how, you know, that you are kind of going inside that black box and and making sure they know how this is happening and what is happening uh, digitally. Have, have there been advances in technology that have contributed to signal processing that, you know, how, how has that played in, in the advancement of this field? Oh, yes. I'm glad you asked. Um, many of the advances in signal processing that have contributed to the evolution of the field in our game actually come from the work of electrical engineers. In fact, any 
self-respecting signal processor in geophysics owes a huge debt to colleagues in the electrical engineering and applied math fields. Both of these disciplines have made very significant contributions to the way that we process data today. For example, take seismic imaging, which is not a subject that we cover in our course, but seismic imaging is an operation performed in, in every oil company, in every processing shop around the globe. And those techniques owe a lot to work by people who process images. And people who do image processing straddle many different disciplines, including, but not exclusive, it's not just electrical engineers, but also physicists. And uh, we've borrowed, for that matter, from the medical profession as well, because the medical profession is very interested in the image processing of their um, X-ray recordings. And for example, while the medical profession were the first to use what now goes under the name of uh, tomography or CAT scans, the geophysicists adopted these techniques and uh, use them today. So our field has been influenced by many other fields as well, but it works both ways. The, these fields I've just described have also benefited from looking at the work that's being done in the uh, exploration geophysical profession. What do you see next for this field? Well, that's hard to say. Um, first of all, I don't think, speaking of geophysical signal processing, that it will be important while our energy needs are satisfied by oil and gas. But as these transition to other uh, forms of energy, that uh, discipline will be less used. However, signal processing, leaving out the word geophysics, but simple signal processing as it applies to so many other fields nowadays, including medicine and communications, that this field will exist as long as there are humans on this planet. So what this means is that people who study signal processing should be taught signal processing as a field with, with an application to geophysical, to those who wish to become geophysicists with applications then to geophysics. But the core signal processing field should be taught in such a way that it can be that it is applicable to other disciplines. I mean, we have only to see the job losses in the, in the oil industry over the past couple of years. Many people have been laid off and they will not come back to this profession. So we're not doing them a service by teaching them only geophysical applications of signal processing. Rather, we should be teaching them signal processing as a discipline so that they can use it should they be unlucky enough to lose their jobs. Uh, because unfortunately, this is a, a situation that can happen to any people in the industry today. This was much less the case when Anders and I were active in this field. But it, it's, it's a fact of life today, and we might as well prepare for it. You and Enders have certainly significantly contributed to this field for decades now. Is there yes. a particular aspect of working on this, on this topic in this field that has been a highlight for you through the years? Yes. Well, um, I've thought about that off and on. And actually, I think anybody who's lucky enough 
to make contributions of the kind that we've been able to make uh, is is simply is 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 simply due to luck. You have to be in the right place at the right time. It's very simple. Anders and I began working in geophysical signal processing at the correct moment when the oil industry was ready to adopt more modern techniques of, of processing their recordings. And more importantly, we were graduate students at the time when digital computers first came into use. MIT at that time had one of the first large digital computers in the country. There were only a couple. And uh, our university was lucky enough, thanks to the US Air Force, to have uh, what was then one of the most powerful digital computers. Parenthetically, I might mention that the computer that we worked on when we were students is now in the Boston Science Museum where it's considered to be as novel, say, as a dinosaur. All the computing power that we had available to us is in a small fraction of an iPhone, uh, presumably in your pocket as we speak together. In other words, an iPhone has infinitely more compute power than we had at our disposal in 1960. But when you really think about it, you have to be at the right place at the right time. And that's a matter of luck. Sure, you have to have uh, an interest in what you're doing and you have to have a, a talent for quantitative thinking. But there are a lot of people who have this talent. But that's not enough. You also need to be in the right place at the right time. I can't emphasize that more, more often. At seg.org forward slash podcast, you will find the show notes and links for all the details for the May 23rd through 26th Geophysical Signal Processing 101 virtual course. If you cannot attend all four days, recordings of the course will be made available to registrants. Now through the end of May, we're celebrating graduates with up to 70% savings for all on selected titles in the SEG shop. Get details at seg.org forward slash book sale. If you enjoy the show, review us on iTunes. Your review helps others find the show. Subscribe to Seismic Sound Off on the podcast app of your choice to receive the latest episodes first. Season 1 of Seismic Sound Off is sponsored by the SEG Wiki home to hundreds of biographies of key geoscientists, geophysical tutorials, and core content from the science of applied geophysics. Visit wiki.seg.org to learn how you can grow the world's first online geophysics encyclopedia. Original music by Zach Bridges. Special thanks to Beth Donica. This episode was produced by Isaac Farley and hosted, edited, and produced by me, Andrew Gary. Thank you for listening. This is Seismic Sound Off, signaling off.